The production of this video was made possible by the direct support of the TLGTW official fan club. To its committee members, thank you. To its Eye and Gold committee members, Enid, the Games Nihilist, and JC of the Bacon Conspectus, a special thank you. And to every other member of the OF, thank you even more. So I burn. Consider me yours. Disclaimer. This video spoils everything in Elden Ring and builds off the information established in episodes 1, 2, and 3 of this series. You know, Ronnie. Like, while I've liked calling the story of Elden Ring deliberately shallow before, and you'll notice I have an attraction to phrasing things that pretend to step on other people's toes like this, perhaps that is, maybe, me lying. It might be better for me to describe this story as concise instead or maybe just dense. As we've covered in episode 2, for example, elements like the mere logo of a school of magic, the phrasing of forces related to gravity rather than gravity itself, and the physical existence of backwards time travel, all working together into the reveal that in this setting, the laws of relativity actually include polarity, make it hard to dispute the presence of a staggering level of depth within a game that is famously not otherwise that talkative, and infuriatingly arithmophobic. As I've said before, the main premise of this show is that I'm not supposed to use my imagination to fill in any of the story's current gaps, or make assumptions as to what I think would be likely to be revealed in future content. Uh, but doesn't the sound of secluding oneself to canon like that seem like such a drag? I mean, yeah, I said so, maybe, that everything else is up to you or whatever. But what about me? What about Snake Eyes Teiru G? Because just so you know, there are so many topics I'm mourning behind the scenes of this show. It's like, on the chains of its canon-only premise, I am held back, strangled even, from discussing things like, uh like looking for what in-universe and literary symbolisms there are from the settings in-universe fictional art pieces. The in-universe fictional art, you guys. Can you imagine how stupidly long these videos would be if I allowed myself to actually include these things more? These episodes would never be fucking finished. How about the fact that by all the individual foodstuffs we're shown the people of this continent have access to, along with the confirmation that they have bees as well, means, for a fact, that it is absolutely canonically feasible to make a burger and fries combo in the lands between. And there are other things that people have asked I talk about in these videos too, that I can't because they happen to concern things that the game itself doesn't currently provide any unambiguous answers for. Like, what is that? What the hell is this? Who's this guy? And just where are all the quarries where all these bricks were made, right? Although, maybe that one is just me. Because, for my record, the reasons behind, like, the decision of making my show like this isn't that I'm unable to do otherwise, right? Like, like, this show is about all detailing what is currently objectively correct, but don't take that to mean that it's like that because I'm scared of, of being wrong, right? In fact, of that very risk of possibly being wrong about the fictional story of this video game, maybe for some people, they do. But that risk ain't a risk I fear. It's a risk I relish. Because after all, if there wasn't no risk of being wrong, where'd all the fun in placing your bets be from? Maybe I can lay out the canon story all fine and all good, right? But what does that leave me? Just handing out cards at poker without participating myself? And after all the effort I put in? How could that be fucking fair? I'm a gambling woman. So obviously then you agree, right? That the dealer deserves to play? 
that I deserve to play too, don't I? Don't I? So with all of just fucking that having been said, and by that I'm of course referring to everything I just went over just now across the past like 50 seconds or so, uh, you were all just listening to me say, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? Even though I'm not wearing shoes. Because I am thinking, now that I actually do have all of my mistakes out of the way, as well as, of course, an interim now between here and the release of episode four. I'm thinking maybe I should indulge myself. So, for this episode, imagine me as if disrobed of my canonical bindings. Because, especially for this stuff that doesn't actually have anything conclusive in the game yet, there is indeed a lot for me to talk about. Some, uh, something you want to say, Ronnie? To start us off, let's talk about the main symptoms, as it were, for how we see the flame of frenzy when it actually manifests itself. That is to say, how the flame of frenzy works. What I'm referring to, of course, is how being afflicted with a flame of frenzy is given the unique signifier of literally making you cry, and how the status regarded as madness itself is when we see able to be inflicted both from external physical means and internal mental ones. As we can currently observe it, the flame of frenzy bears two meaningful requirements. Observable requirement one, the creature must have a human intelligence i.e. the creature must be a person. Since we recognize that chaos is indeed an artificial ideology, the flame of frenzy requiring a being to have the capacity for ideology first explains itself. But then we get to observable requirement two, the person requires a special presence of a something else among such creatures of human intelligence. With this something else being something that, specifically, the very, very vast majority of people in the lands between do not have. Resulting in the Flame of Frenzy, as we can see, not being something that these people can succumb to, but for something else, evidently, that these people can. And this thing is something excluding our own Tarnished as well, since we needed to have the Flame of Frenzy inserted into us manually. This Flame of Frenzy's second requirement is what makes it so unique amongst the multiple magical ideological systems vying in the lands between. To its seeming detriment in spreading, there are like, what, 40 individual creatures across the entire game that actually have the frenzy on them? 
but also a uniquely apparent ease in spreading as well. The Flame of Frenzy bears a means of contagion that none of its fellow instances of order share with it. Unlike the Golden Order, which requires conscious effort to be believed in, meaning though that that belief can still be lost, or the Order of Rot, which by spreading through a physical disease doesn't require being believed in in the first place, meaning though that that belief can still be fought, if a person ever genuinely comes to believe in the ideology presented by the Frenzied Flame, what we see is that that belief becomes, objectively, impossible to lose again. As we are able to witness on ourselves, the manifestations brought forth by the Flame of Frenzy proceed to continually perpetuate that person's thoughts of it by itself. And for the actual in-universe sufferers of the Frenzy, looking upon their eyes, we see that their manifestations of Frenzy magic are, indeed, being cast, as it were, perpetually. In its victims indeed, the Flame of Frenzy's madness constructs a feedback loop by the unbreakable power of determinism, the law of causality, preserving its mental existence within a being, their belief in it, indefinitely. An effect to cause itself, then cause itself to cause itself, an ideology thus made objectively impossible to lose. And so it is appropriately shown, wherever the existence of the frenzied flame is found fully manifested into reality, such as the NPCs who have frenzy in their eyes, or are tarnished after being invested with it by the three fingers, it's presented as being, accurately, completely and totally immune to being gotten rid of. A most sinister instance of fate at play. At least wherever the universe's laws of physics aren't disrespected. Is this permanent marker-like property of the Flame of Frenzies perhaps in spite of its evident rarity across the lands between? Or, in fact, is that uncommonness itself the very reason behind it? Well, currently, for the ambiguous second observable requirement of the Flame of Frenzy's ideology, I reckon why Yellow Chaos Flame is able to spread like it is, through both external means and internal ones, between human intelligences exclusively, and utterly impossible to, once its vision has been brought into reality, ever in your life get rid of, is as a reflection of how one's faith in this ideology itself, the desire for the complete and total end of the world, is in fact dependent on, purely and uniquely, one specific emotion. The raw feeling with infinite potential that is, not fear, nor awe, nor reason, but mere overwhelming sadness. Those who gave me grapes, howled without words, saying they wished they were never born. Sadness and grief, that is the Flame of Frenzy's second requirement. After all, as I'm sure many of us might know, there really is no limit to just how bad depression can get. As we know from real life, humans are, prominently, a species intelligent and imaginative enough that being made to feel sad or frustrated or angry or so on, solely from our thoughts, is incredibly easy for us. Not only in response to memories of real events, but by thoughts of fictional events just as well. Animals very attentive, we are able to think about situations that don't actually exist so effectively that as a result it induces us into feeling angry or sad or frustrated and so on internally. From internal stimuli, our own thoughts, as opposed to external stimuli, the world around us. In simpler terms, humans are uniquely capable of making ourselves feel emotions, not just unconsciously by accident, but consciously on purpose as well. In a sense you could say, a person's thoughts are, literally, that powerful. And so, returning to the game, where what we're dealing with is a straight up magical emotion, noting the status that is the Flame of Frenzy literally being called upsetness. The overwhelming emotional distress inflicted upon others by the physical creation of the Frenzied Flame is able to be afflicted upon yourself through the mental creation of the Frenzied Flame in your imagination. Literally, the same way that consciously thinking about something that makes you sad can make you begin to, subconsciously, actually feel sad from those thoughts, directly thinking about the Flame of Frenzy's madness in order to encant it with magic results in indirectly feeling that madness yourself because that's what you're thinking about. 
But just where am I actually getting this idea of singling out how humans experience emotions specifically as being what's specially relevant here in the first place? As you'll recall from the start of this segment, perhaps, by none other than the one singular form of emotional expression that across the entirety of the animal kingdom remains completely and utterly unique to our species, it just so happens is the most prominent result of the Flame of Frenzy's influence. Making you cry. Uncontrollably. Dare I say even, as if taken by a frenzied state of mind. As is known, the phenomenon known as crying is the physiological mechanism by which us humans help in releasing our emotions after they've built up enough that we become overwhelmed by them. Representing this, when in-game our tarnish is overcome by these specific, magical, crazy emotions, we, well, cry like crazy. This is also why the ability to resist madness is shown dependent on, literally, how good your focus is. The better one is able to focus, meaning to maintain your composure, and stamp down one's own feelings without your body triggering that natural catharsis button, the more madness you're capable of enduring, before finally needing to break down. As such is why people who are completely given into madness, or in more ordinary terms, people who have become legit suicidally hopeless, now have eyes that are, visually, eternally crying. They've reached such a point where the extreme emotions that crying normally works to release are literally just never-ending. And so, in order to achieve the only way by which their pain would end, they now believe, since to recall by the Flame of Frenzy's magic exclusively requiring faith, what requires are necessarily these people's subjective opinions, for the universe itself, ending for good. Currently, the only kinds of creatures we've seen succumbed enough to the Flame of Frenzy for it to have been magically manifested so far have been humans, obviously intelligent people, trolls, obviously intelligent people, and rats. And about these rats, I am not going to disparage rats on this, right? I can believe in rats being as smart as humans. I have seen Ratatouille, okay? I have seen Great Mouse Detective, and I have seen Flushed Away, okay? They do some crazy shit in Flushed Away. I've seen what rats can do. And if they're supposed to be just as capable of experiencing real fucking deal suicidal nihilistic depression as humans are, I don't have any difficulty whatsoever in accepting that. Or, you know, I guess, being scavengers, these rats just ate from the corpses of those that did have the flame of frenzy on them, and just got poisoned with it, effectively, in that way instead. Maybe. Maybe that is possible as well. So, still, to these creatures of human intelligence who have been found in the darkest despair, of an unending sadness making every hour a pure and unjustifiable agony, if what's wrong with the world, to them, is being alive, then the only way that the world could be fixed would be if being alive no longer existed. This would also be why we see certain groups of frenzy vulnerable people, who ostensibly have it, at minimum, just as bad as those who are mad with frenzy, not actually being afflicted themselves. The most definitive example of this being the Misbegottens. An entire species of intelligent people made to be enslaved, or worse, for life. And yet, despite having so much to be mad about, nowhere are there found any misbegotten actually afflicted with madness. The ideas represented by the Frenzied Flame fundamentally include the complete giving up of any possibility whatsoever for what is wrong with the world to ever actually be fixed. As we see with Edgar the Revenger, the game's main example of a person succumbing to the Frenzy, and you can see how deep I go in this show with it being this much time before I actually brought him up, he ends up going mad. Because, no matter how much revenge he ever meets out, the actual motive for that despair, the event of his daughter's death, can never be changed. Edgar wants to have his daughter back, but he never will. In this world, his daughter is dead, because of his inaction. 
As such, you could say, his madness at that fact ends up fully maxing out. And the next time we see him, he's gone slap crazy. Given up him and his unbearable emotions of sorrow and rage that promises zero, the yellow chaos flame. Thus, by highlighting this, the differences for the misbegotten become that apparent. Given up on the world is exactly what they haven't done. These people are literally just all too hopeful to succumb to, to agree with, to believe in the central idea of the flame of frenzy, that there is no point in living. Proactive, such that instead of in despair, lamenting over their shackles, they've been breaking them. And as a plus, crying makes your eyes burn. So there's that as well. Now, I'm sure you're thinking now how shockingly attractive my logic and reasoning has almost certainly just been. How alluring and beautiful my mind must be as I am. You are thinking these things. But... In addition to those, of which of course all of you are very correct to have been thinking, what I've just discussed has also all just been, in no uncertainty of speaking, headcanon to the actual story of the actual video game Elden Ring. Although, to be honest, I don't like the word headcanon at all. Not that I have any good reason for that, though. And I can only push against modern parlance so much until I'm just being confusing on purpose. Which, you know, I could be if I wanted. Don't think I couldn't. So, I suppose, headcanon will remain the word I'll use. In any case, what have I actually meant in referring to the conclusions I've just drawn out regarding the flame of frenzy and its symptoms and its modes of dispersal as non-canonical here? In contrast to the supposed premise of my regular program, conclusions that are canonical, to ask... Why am I labeling this as just a theory, where the rest of this show I've labeled as outright canon only instead? By none other than in my reasoning, my having used one particular idea that, very possibly because of how I purposely worded it, some of you might not have even noticed was outside of the ordinary in the first place. My assertion that, regarding frenzy, a relevancy to human emotion from how human expressions work in real life is actually present in Elden Ring. Okay, yeah, I'm being confusing on purpose. Here's what I actually mean. Take a proper look at the actual logic I used to establish my point before I returned to raising evidence from within the game again to further support it. It looks like it's crying. That means that it relates to actual crying, as in real life. It looks like it's an emotion. That means it relates to actual emotion, as in real life. And mind you, the way I presented wasn't in this order either. I started by pointing out what's currently known, specifically outlining what is currently in canon, a plot hole that I then suddenly and succinctly fill in by just saying that, because in real life, that humans are the only species that emotionally cries, that that means the act of crying in the fictional world of Elden Ring is therefore, somehow, uniquely or significantly human as well. And then I just rolled with it. I brought in the focus stat, I brought in the rat joke, I literally waited an entire year in real life from when I first came up with that hilarious rat joke to bring it to you in the script, and then I brought in my best and most character-focused example for last. The narrative juxtaposition between the people in shit situations that are frenzied and the people in shit situations who aren't. Now, obviously, I didn't write the segment like this specifically to deceive you. I wrote it like that because it's, you know, more interesting and cool to read that way than if I literally just listed everything out like some shitty essay. Since I'm a poet, doing that is my forte. But as a byproduct of me trying to write these segments as like, fun to actually consume, 
The fact that this point here isn't actually based on any objective evidence is made very easy to miss because of how it is. I say it the same way as I said everything else, that since crying is uniquely human in real life, then crying is uniquely humane in Elden Ring. But hey, there's a certain pole arm in this game, and the Dark Souls games, called the Lucerne, but that, by itself, doesn't exactly confirm the existence of Switzerland in either the setting of the Dark Souls or Elden Ring, does it? Despite there not being physically present anywhere within the story, that is to say lore of this game, where my concept of how human emotions specifically work, having any particular significance to how the effects of the Flame of Frenzy works, actually is expressed in the first place. By my observation, however, that idea is expressed. And then this subjective truth, or in equivalent terms, a subjectively determined or asserted truth, is used by me to draw further conclusions from the rest of the game. As such, being an idea that includes non-canonical information, it is a theory that is non-canon. Just as much, being an idea including information originating from inside my head, it is, accurately, a theory that is headcanon. Now, with this having been defined, let's get what's really important about that of not being canon out of the way as well. Does not being canon therefore mean that everything I just brought up about the Flame of Frenzy just now was actually just completely random and meaningless? No, obviously it does not, because that would be fucking stupid. Hopefully, pointing this all out also helps put into perspective just how useless it actually is to treat whether something is canonical or not as any kind of distinguishing factor between good ideas regarding a fictional story and bad ones. Quality, indeed, is a thing with many facets, so to try and measure it with shortcuts, it's found, always wastes more effort than it saves. Homo dynamics. Anyway, get a load of this fucking volcano Lane Dell is built on. Or, better yet still, literally built in. Yeah. Cuz, by the depicting of, specifically, basaltic rock in and around it, we can tell that the Altus Plateau is a volcanic plateau. Or, to be precise, a plateau made in large part by igneous rock. So, who's the volcano that made it? Mount Gilmere, of course, is both way too small and way too young to have been responsible for building the Altus Plateau itself. So where can it be, the actual volcano responsible for this such formation? You just might have noticed yourself, but upon taking a closer look at old fantasy Rome and their capital city Constantinople over here, one can account for the considerable altitude it has versa the rest of Altus. Comparing from its north, from its south, from its east, and as many a wary traveler might recall, from the amount of stairs they had to climb, it's western side as well. All of this being to establish that the path to the Golden Capital is, already, none other than a path up to the top of Altus's shortest and oldest mountain. Even if, maybe, this was something all of you were already aware of. Recall further, then, the features found at the top of this mountain, the massive crater within which the inner walls of Landell are built, and, behind them, the lake that these inner walls themselves are evidently serving to retain, so as to have the tall-ass moat separating Landell's outskirts from the city itself. A lake that, additionally, for the city's peripheral districts not on its central island, are built either on land that's been walled off and drained, partially submerged, or supported on stilts in order to accommodate it. A mountain with a crater on top with an island in the middle, filled with rainwater. What we have depicted here is none other than a caldera of a now extinct volcano, with its crater filled with fresh water, making it into a lake. With that central island, atop which we see the city's wealthiest districts were built on, 
being this massive volcano's second central cone. Alike to the secondary dome of Lawetlatla, surrounded by water, it instead creates an island alike to Wizard Island in Crater Lake, Oregon. So not only is Mount Lindell a volcano, it's a Somnian volcano too. One that, while obviously inactive now, had once produced us a mountain of such evident size that, during its younger days, certainly, its period of extancy may well be the player for our missing role, of the Builder of Altus. But our story doesn't end just above ground. It continues through the subterranean shunning grounds. Responsible for managing the waste and water of the continent's capitalmost city, the majority of the Shunning Grounds' chambers, we see, are indeed exactly as they would be. Networks of concrete pipes, access ways, and canals. Almost every room in the Para Dungeon can be seen relating to the actual functions hundreds if not thousands of Landell servants and slaves would have maintained within the Waste Management Complex. With one distinct outlier. Just what is supposed to be this? A singular massive vertical shaft multiple times the height of the entire rest of the Shunning Grounds, whose bottom is found only accessible by no means other than a single chain elevator in a secret room guarded by a squad of living jars, that requires you to navigate a labyrinthine route through the pipes themselves first to even get to. Talk about a place closed off from the rest of the underground, right? as well as, that is to say, a place impossible to escape. Because, for those who might have been in the dark about this, because it's not exactly explicit, the Forsaken Depths, specifically, are where all the eternal imprisonings we hear of for the subterranean shunning grounds actually all took place. Where the rest of the level we passed over are the city's actual water and waste facilities, an actively maintained sewer system, of course, being one of the most thoroughly monitored places a city can have, would be a terrible fucking place to try to eternally hide something. With the shunning grounds evidently experiencing such heavy foot traffic that actual roads were built to accommodate it. Unbeknownst to anyone, for eternity, the omen we see, and others, most certainly would not be, if they hadn't all just been down here instead. To specify, the demigod omen we see in the upper layers of the shunning grounds aren't currently here as prisoners, on account of the fact that they're all very much not imprisoned, as well as armed, what they're acting here as is guards. The place they're acting to defend being, specifically, where they actually had been thrown into and subsequently freed from by Morgoth. This. Now, uh, I'm taking the extra time to establish this because I haven't actually seen this point brought up by anybody else. For the reason that I get to later in the video, I feel that this is a meaningfully significant thing storyline-wise to make us sure of. While the rest of this episode is still about my theories, this, so far, is a canonical fact. The actual place where the royal omen were fleshed down to was the Forsaken Depths. Although I don't mean fleshed literally. Cuz, as very easily missed, the Forsaken Depths chamber is actually open to the air. So generally speaking, Omen born among members of America's extended family, made invincible by their biologically inherited grace, and thus impossible to cut the Omen horns off of, were instead chucked down the garbage chute, more accurately. And yes, I do know that for the Forsaken Depths, this massive fucking hole in the ceiling, for some reason, doesn't actually exist above in Landell itself, where it otherwise should be. Often, however, as with times like these, you are forced to just acknowledge that what are, literally, levels in a video game are still the video game levels that they are. This isn't actually the fantastical sewer system under a golden metropolis in a magical world, for example. This is a piece of software that I have installed on my computer. For real life reasons, consistencies in narrative or aesthetic design in something can be set aside, and as we can evidently see, are. And I am not going to get on FromSoft's fucking case about this, by the way, okay? I'm not gonna throw a fit about the massive fucking hole that is visibly open to the sunlight and exposed and directly above the Forbidden Death checkpoint not actually being above the Forsaken Depths checkpoint, all right? 
It's fine. Okay? It's fine. I'm not going to get on FromSoft's case about this. They're already dealing with fucking workplace abuse, so I'm sure that they already have enough on their goddamn plate. It's fine that this humongous hole at the top of the Forsaken Depths doesn't actually exist above ground on top of the Forsaken Depths. So it's fine. It's okay, and I'm not upset about it. Okay, so... To finally return to our topic at hand, as to why the Forsaken Depths Chamber is so tall and vast and distinct from the rest of the sewer complex, because, in truth, it is nothing else but my Mountain Lane Del Volcano's original volcanic conduit, the lava pipe to which the Capital Island's central secondary dome is also accredited, on account of its direct opening into the island, whereupon its discovery by Lane Del's administration, the natural cavity was built into and used for the so-seeming worst of the kingdom's refuse. With this place being a volcanic conduit then, where does it lead? Well, first, past the Forsaken Depths checkpoint, we find the Cathedral of the Forsaken, a place we know to be heavily associated with those afflicted by the Omen Curse. Past the Cathedral though, we reach the languishing Grand Caravan, whose unjust imprisonment is said to have directly brought about the madness so currently to plague the lands between. We'll cover these guys another time, but with the omens being placed on top of, effectively, the Grand Caravan, this would mean that the throwing of demigod omen babies down the drain, and thus the appearance of the omen curse in the first place, all actually took place only relatively recently, after the nomadic merchants were buried alive, since it's the omen that are found above the merchants. And isn't that interesting? Because this makes it so one group's banishment underground thusly predates the Grand Caravans, the Nox. For below the Grand Caravan, at the bottom of their tomb, laid the false floor that was, in truth, the ceiling of the Shunning Grounds' lowest chamber, the Frenzied Flame Prescription. Built, this ceiling, by whom? Obviously not the Grand Caravan themselves. For one, they have no motive for hiding this room, they're already all down here, and for two, no merchants are actually present in the prescription area itself. What is present in the prescription area itself, however, is an illusory wall, and present behind that illusory wall is a tunnel hiding a chest. But the chest is a trick, it's a red herring, placed specifically to deceive the person who finds it, into thinking there was thus nothing left to look for. This tunnel hides no chest. Behind that illusory wall, what the tunnel leads to instead is indeed a second illusory wall. And behind that illusory wall is the dugout entrance to the Deep Root Depths. All this is to establish, of course, that past a triple disguised tunnel, only shown reachable at all after breaking through a false floor first, which, as we can attest to ourselves, had never been broken before, was a route to no other place than the first bastion of the Nox, the now nameless Eternal City One. Since, as E.G. tells us, that Nocron and Nextella are the twin Eternal Cities, that means that they were made around the same time, leaving Eternal City One here to be what can only be the first Eternal City, from which Nocron and Ostella, following the Shofra and Einzel underground rivers that draw from Deep Root, themselves descended from. Of course, almost certainly after the calamity referenced in the Remembrance of Estelle. Although that's all still for another day, too. In any case, since it stands that the people behind the illusory walls concealing a man-made passage into the deep root depths would then be the same people behind the false ceiling sealing off the frenzied flame prescription, the Nox, although at this point they hadn't actually made the Eternal City yet, so they weren't actually known as the Nox, so... The Proto-Nox had built all of these. which means the Protonox were the first to be forsaken. The imprisonment of the Grand Caravan was something that happened specifically after the imprisonment of those members of America's ethnic group, the Newman, including those of her extended family who eventually became the Black Knives, who went on to become the Nox. Ending with the appearance of the Omen Curse happening after all of that.
As a note, however, this is all still being described by me under the guise of pure backstory, meaning without making any direct reference to the appearances of these locations themselves, as the video game levels they all still literally are. Otherwise, should I start having to do that? I'd have to start taking facts like that the entirety of the lands between has still only got one farm on it at face value. Although it is interesting to note that Dominula specifically is placed right along the highway connecting Altus to Mount Gilmir, with volcanic ash by itself being a powerful natural fertilizer. The reason behind Dominula, singular farm of the lands between, being placed where it is, may very well be so that it can be easily delivered the ashes spewed out from Mount Gelmir, as well as perhaps why it was decided for Mount Gelmir itself to originally be occupied. Having control over that region's production, despite the volcano's own obvious danger and the required cost to expel its native inhabitants, would have been extremely advantageous economically, as well as impetus behind the numerous shacks and villages dotting the Baby Mountain's feet. This, perhaps, also gives us a why as to why the original plans for the establishment of Volcano Manor by Lord Roycard were approved by the Golden Order administration originally. You know, all as uh, extraneous to the literal king of the Golden Order being Roycard's divorced dad already. Back to the real volcano. Below the volcanic conduit that is a forsaken depths chamber, directly below it in fact, we arrive to the deep root depths. What exactly are these deep root depths, this massive underground chamber below the Erdtree capital? For my Mount Dell volcano theory, the deep root depths are this mountain's now extinct magma chamber. While it's inactive today, of course, what this grain gallery had once been was a primordial bosom of the earth by which Mount Dell just stated. Here, where the roots of the Erdtree itself, or rather, the Erdtree by its older name, first grew out, would then in time be found as we know it now the subterranean sanctuary for the empire's most patient of traitors, the ones who would become the Nox, exactly under Landell's nose. And then they all had to evacuate down what used to be these two, quote, pyroducts that descend from Mount Landell's magma chamber. Their volcano's long-ago extinction and preceding income of groundwater having since made them into what we recognize today as a chauffeur and nine cell underground rivers. This origin of theirs being also why, for the two great underground rivers, that they are able to span more than a third of the continent's landmass and still connect so directly to deep root that the only other way to enter it that we know is by hyperloop out the chauffeur. Pyroducts, coming from a lava flow's outermost layer solidifying while the still liquid rock beneath it empties out to elsewhere, form such distinctive cavities as we see matched in game. Mere pareidolia? It's certainly not implausible. Say, perhaps, not even unlikely. But I believe that it isn't. Long winding tunnels speckled with skylights, and multiple sudden vertical drops. So, we can say, that after Mount Dell went extinct, and who knows how many years of erosion after that, our tectonics meet their ends with the underground waterways we both know and ants today. There's the pretty ginormous discrepancy here that I haven't acknowledged yet. As some of you more geographically minded may know, what I've been calling pyroducts here are much more often instead referred to by their more common name, lava tubes. And thus, the obvious question arises as to this last geological feature of my Mount Landell theory. For how these apparent lava tubes are supposed to be directly connecting to a magma chamber? Just what is my excuse? Well, if you'd asked me this one year ago, I'd have conceded. I did not have an answer then. But, 
Let me bring to your attention just what came out between my original conception of this theory last year and the actual writing of this script. None other than this image. APNG announcing the DLC with the DLC's name with Mikola on a horse. And, most notably for us, a far distant plant one might even consider somewhat matching to the title of Shadow of the Earth Tree on its own. How mysterious. Looking upon this structure then, what would you say is the most interesting feature surrounding it? That's exactly fucking right. It's not on a plateau. It's just the most mysterious thing in this entire image, right? What the fuck happened to the Altus Plateau, where the Earth Tree's base is placed? If I take enough of a plunge in assuming, though, that this giant ominous tree is indeed supposed to be something like a shadow to the Earth Tree, asserting that just enough of that is so, whereas then went our fucking Altus Plateau. So listen, right? Here's what happened. During the teenage years of Mount Landell, while its volcanism was still active, the region we know as Altus would have been on basically level ground to the regions adjacent, Lyrnia and the rest of the south, akin to how it looks in the DLC announcement PNG. During this time, when the eruptions to have formed my pyroducts actually took place, at the massive lava flows from which the beginnings of my Shofren Einzel lava tubes would be dug out with, were produced. These massive lava flows being the ones as we see responsible for the thick layers of flood basalt we find in northern Lyernia, closest to the Altus Plateau, and visibly distinct from the layer of sedimentary rock it sits on, that composes the rest of the southern continent as well. The presence of basalt like this, by itself, shows that the volcanic activity responsible for building the Altus Plateau did flow over to nearby Lyernia, meaning at the very least that at one point in the past they did indeed share an elevation. And meaning, as well, that when my alleged Schofren Ein Cell Pyroduct first formed, those lava tubes would have been situated above their underground magma chamber, as one would consider normal for lava tubes. But then, at some point after we see, Altus went up. And while the structures to become the Schofren Ein Cell stayed where they were, the mountain they came from rose high into the sky. As a result, where our two pyroducts had originally pointed towards Mount Landell's volcanic vent, they're found now pointing towards its magma chamber instead. Afterwards, by the negative pressure between them, the magma of Mount Landell exploded through, connecting the two, allowing the eventual waterways for the underground rivers to be formed. And that is why, as yours truly explains, a supposed pair of lava tubes descend from their volcano's magma chamber instead. So, to recap everything, a volcanic plateau with a tall mountainous peak, with a caldera at the top, within the center a secondary cone, opening into its volcanic conduit, with, descending from its empty magma chamber, a pair of rivers originally carved out from that volcano's pyroducts. Here we have thus, and if I am indeed the first person to come up with this, I've hopefully gotten to pick the name for it too, Mount Landell. But you don't think this is all I'd have, did you? That from this show, a theory from this girl, would present with anything less? Understanding how magic works in this story from the previous episodes, that is to say, specifically, the moving of a subjective mental thing into the objective material world, i.e. the direct turning of thought into reality, lends the situation surrounding the Flame of Ruin to a considerable amount of suspicion. This was something I held off on bringing up for until now, because I've been saving it for this, and it's possible some of you might have come to a similar question as well. But, since all forms of magic fundamentally come from a subjective mental image, as for the Flame of Ruin to burn the Earth Tree explicitly required one who envisions the Flame, what is the vision for the Flame of Ruin to set the Earth Tree ablaze actually supposed to be an envisioning of? What image is the magic of the Flame of Ruin supposed to be based on 
that results in the Erd tree specifically being irrevocably at risk by it. To build the answer, my reader, I start with asking you this. Regarding the specific shape of a tree, not even to say a tree that was on fire, can it not already be framed as evocative of a volcanic eruption already? The skies of Altus are stained with gold that cloaks the skies, and then the Erd tree is set ablaze. Mount Landell made into a volcano again, its crater reburied in ashes once more, and a shroud pulled over the heavens again, not with gold, but with fire instead. As across the entire continent, for an innumerable number of days after, still smoldering ejecta descends slowly down from the atmosphere. It's not from nowhere that the clouds above Altus should blot out the sun and recolor the skies. The image that the flame of ruin conjures then, what it magically brings into material reality, was never any kind of fictional conceit or ideology, but merely a memory of an actual past event. An ancient remembrance of what the mountain itself, the peak out from which sprouts the earth tree, used to be. What it used to do. And thus, merely under the prospect of recreating a previous instance of objective reality, the Erd Tree's possible fate of being swallowed up in the image of Mount Landell erupting could never go away. That's what made it anathema. That's what made it the Erd Tree's curse. Because even if, even if you destroyed all living memories of an actual past event, that past event still actually happened. You can't make the reality of that disappear. And by that same fact of the Flame of Ruin being simply a vision of real geological events, is also why, despite being labeled anathema heretical to the Erd Tree, by specifically its religious authorities, the truth of the Flame of Ruin's existence is still able to be glimpsed within the faith of the Erd Tree. Just as how Goldmask, also by essentially gazing into the remembrances of the Erd Tree, his faith, manages to catch his own glimpse of heresy, the truth of Radagon's existence in relation to Queen Merica. The creation of Radagon for America, by its being a real past event, especially since this is a setting whose universe exists under determinism, was consequently going to leave some kind of evidence behind, by something, somewhere. For eventually, someone, anyone, or multiple people, to connect what errant dots and come upon that truth once more. It seems you just can't persuade the past. And this is, of course, everything behind the conceit of how burning the Erd tree was explicitly the first ever cardinal sin put into practice as well. How could a future event, one that hadn't even happened yet since it was evidently only prophesized to occur later, somehow have been already known about and already labeled heretical from the very start of that religious institution's inception? How was the possibility of the Erd tree burning able to have been predicted and understood so accurately and so early. By where the possibility itself comes from, it was known what the Flame of Ruin truly was by mere geological history, when Mount Landell was still a babe. Cool. So, uh, you may now ask, if the vision for the Flame of Ruin is actually supposed to be of, like, a volcano erupting, what was the Fell God? It's a personification of the volcano. When that volcano became extinct, the power of the fell god, what Mount Landell used to be like, continued to exist only within the minds of the fire giants because of their religion. Their literal faith preserved the imagination of that power, and thus, as Merica started her war over, that existential threat to her. And that's not the only thing I've got for connecting the Forge of the Giants and Mount Landell specifically, either. Tell me... If you recall, the fire blossoms and the earth leaf flowers. Plants whose petals bear the exact same shape, differing only in colors that yet grow from completely different sources and bear completely different powers. Powers indeed that are supposed to be anathema to each other. Yet whose sources byproducts produce identically shaped plants, 
meaning thus that it's the sources themselves, the Erd Tree and the Flame of Ruin, that actually have the shared origin instead. And if Mount Dell had indeed once been an actual active volcano, that certainly explain another interesting discrepancy regarding our current knowledge of the Erd Tree's history as well. The Great Tree, the moniker used for the Erd Tree in its age prior to America's invasion, has a notably unique nickname that, despite referring to the same individual organism, is evidently not still in use for today. Specifically, that the plant sticking out from the side of that mountain itself used to be known as the Cauldron of Life. Taking my assertion for Mount Dell and applying it here, we thus have an explanation. If Mount Dell had once been volcanically active, the literal heat by which the great tree god's poetic name, a melting pot of material, is thusly provided. Where all life was once blended together, in parts relating to the soul or the spirit, and certainly, if what we see at Mount Gelmer gives us any kind of convergent example, in parts relating to the body as well. Now in the present day, with the actual volcano extinct, so the nickname is as well, the melting pot of living things. If we continue in taking this idea for granted, that the crucible of life was named after an actively volcanic Mount Dell, it might also give us a clue as to what motives the nickname censorship had during the Age of the Golden Order, or the Age of Radagon, as well. To review, back during the Age of Godfrey, prior to the Golden Order's creation, the Crucible Knights were considered legitimate as servants of America's empire, hence their serving under the Elden Lord directly. This is in contrast to now, where basically all but maybe two of them are found assigned to toilet duty. Well, well out of the way, as they say, by the time that, under the Golden Order, Ur-Tree worship itself became considered heretical, no doubt acknowledging the Ur-Tree as it existed from a time where it would have been on top of an active volcano, must have been considered bad to do too. Just as it was with Ur-Tree worship, all was an attempt at hiding the truth behind the Ur-Tree's existence and consequently the Golden Order's existence as a whole. And that's not all, cuz... The Rune of Death, discharged from the Elden Ring when the Golden Order was created after the end of the Age of Godfrey, as it just so happens, is explicitly associated with the material Obsidian. Obsidian, that is, literally, volcanic glass. In fact, while we're looking at the Rune of Death, you could perhaps frame the colors themselves associated with the different kinds of powers derived from the Elden Ring as actually evocative of temperature. That is to say here, the possible colors for molten rock. Starting with the coldest, with the Rune of Death's black and red, raising the temp with the ancient Erdtree's primordial gold of being orange. The Golden Order's modern gold being yellow, the second hottest. And finally, at the very hottest that lava can get, the fictional unalloyed gold invented by Mikola, going white hot. Leading us, then, to my final piece of evidence, sealing the capstone for Mount Dell Volcano. Taking a moment from IOF, I am proud to say that the long-announced issue number one, the third issue of the TLGTW official fan club members-only kinda monthly newsletter, is finally out and available to read for free, featuring these topics. As you'll be able to see for yourselves, my OF's newsletter promises to cover many things, from production updates to audience Q&A to supplementary content for regular work such as these, and a section of excerpts from my sketchbook at the end. Normally, to gain access to my newsletter, you have to join my OF on Coffee as a $3 supporter or higher, but as is unique for issue one, it is available to read for free. So go and check it out. Should you like what you see, and most importantly, want to actually support me financially in the continued production of my works, join the OF. You'll gain access to the previous two issues of the Kinda Monthly newsletter, as well as, of course, every issue following. As released, Kinda Monthly. Whether you become a member or not, however, know that the brunt of my work will always be free to consume regardless. Fire burns everything, after all. So, such is only fair. I'll be yours. Now, with everything else finally out of the way, we come to my last piece of evidence for this theory. One that, for me, irrevocably seals the deal on my belief in my volcanic Mount Dell. 
Five million years ago, in the original E3 reveal trailer for Elden Ring, there is one scene in it that I don't doubt drew a lot of questions way back when, but that a lot of us have certainly since forgot. In this scene from the trailer, we see a close-up of America's hammer as it's used to destroy and subsequently repair the Elden Ring. On that hammer, however, only here, not anywhere else, and out of nowhere, are attached, of all things, strands of fucking Pele's hair. Volcanic glass produced from cooled lava stretched into thin strands that, in sunlight, shine gold. Truly, it does not get more fucking tectonic. I actually remember all the way back in 2019 specifically wondering just what the hell those strands on that hammer were supposed to be. Literal fucking Pele's hair sticking out from the hammer and fanning out strangely as we see from static fucking electricity. Dead to goddamn rights, baby. To say the least, as the author herself, TLGTW, I believe. And so, if against the actual odds, if it turns out that I actually am correct about Mount Lane Dell, if I am right, and somehow, some way, the Shadow of the Earth Tree DLC is like, by the way, the Mountain Lane Dell is on used to be a volcano, lol. I will take the fucking crown, Queen of Elden Ring lore, and I will put it on my head, and I will super glue it on my head. How's that for making shit up? Since I brushed over this topic, though, and placing Capital Island in my volcano diagram, I know that there's some concern over how exactly the Earth Tree Capital, in the form you play through in-game, came to be as it is. The one responsible for all this damage is fortunately easy to find. It's Grand Sax. By taking notes on the damage, we're actually able to approximate what Grand Sax's flight route was, all the way up to his final destination. So before Grand Sax was slumped beside the fortified manor, just past the Avenue Balcony Gatehouse, he arrived at Lane Dell with the point for his entry and rampage being at this point here, from the southwest. Flying around Landell's outer wall, bypassing it completely, Grand Sax smashed through the Divine Bridge connecting to the Divine Tower West Altus and landed on the inner wall, marked by this prominent point of damage. How can I say that Grand Sax flew around the outer wall? By the visible lack of notable damage on it, evidently, the outer wall was left untouched. And how can I say this damage with Grand Sax is doing specifically? Instead of, for example, the doing of the multiple catapults we see that were used against Landell during the Shattering? For two reasons. One, because as we learned from the Balta Grand Sax, the only time that Landell's walls were broken was by Grand Sax's doing, and by two, that there aren't actually any catapults on this side of the mountain, making Grand Sax unambiguously the only one who could have dealt this damage. Tracing the direction of this damage then, now that we've established it as Grand Sax's starting point, we can see that after flying onto the inner wall, Grand Sax, in essence, circled the perimeter of the city. Taking chunks out of each of these buildings as he jumped from tower to tower, Grand Sax followed the perimeter before reaching this tower west of the Capital Rampart checkpoint and launching himself into Landell's upper city. The upper city that rests on, as I've labeled it, Capital Island, the only land naturally sitting above Landell Lake's waterline where its wealthy districts rest on. Why then Grand Sax had taken this specific meandering path around Landell's perimeter instead of, say, jumping straight into the heart of the city immediately, and the question of why some 60% of Landell appears to just be missing, both actually have the exact same answer. Tumbling and burning, the missing half of the city was sent into the depths of Landell's lake. As buildings like the Divine Bridge give us an example of, structures built above the caldera's waterline were supported on stilts. Stilts that Grand Sax, as he circled around the city's perimeter, would easily have destroyed, and most certainly have been destroyed. Not that, I suppose, any kind of artificially supported structure could probably have supported his weight if Grand Sax had tried to just walk across the city anyway. It is regardless this complete erasure of like half a Landell, which included the effective sealing off of Landell from the outside world, that's also what the actual calamity mentioned that Grand Sax rained down upon the royal capital is in reference to. With almost all of the upper city evidently still standing, if we assume that this was all Landell had ever been, then just imagine, 
Would a few buildings with their roofs torn off and a couple cars overturned be what you'd call calamitous if you were the narrator? If, under the freshwater Alaindale Lake, however, the majority of Alaindale's working class had found their deaths, save those only who lived in their master's homes, all the city's laborers were dead, resulting in, as we see, not one thing having been cleaned, or repaired, or even tipped back upright. For who knows how many decades it's been since the war against the dragons has even been over with. And no way to ship in food, building materials, or new workers to replace the ones they lost. Along with, of course, actually killing tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people along the way. Robbed of their servants and slaves, Grand Sachs single-handedly guaranteed Lane Dell's eminent decay. That would definitely be something, if I was the main menu's narrator, I'd definitely call a calamity. If it was me. In any case though, let's return to Grand Sachs' flight path. After circling the perimeter of Lane Dell's inner wall, Grand Sachs breached here at the East Capitol Rampart and flew into the upper city. His passage being what dug this channel across the roof we follow upon our own arrival to Lane Dell, before cutting this massive V in the wall as he lifted off again. We also see here piles of grey debris slash ashes slash dust which we'll find helpful in tracking Grand Sachs' further damages. From here then, we see Grand Sax flying straight south, smashing the top of this piece of the wall here, before taking a right and biting off the golden tiled roof of this large building. See here again the rubble, ashes, and pieces of burnt timber we find under this path. Carried by the wind and such, these ashes have fallen onto the rooftops below. Afterwards, finally, Grand Sax meets his end here, near Avenue Balcony. Killed by... some means or another. His body's last act of destruction would go on to crush one of the few, if not last, of Landell's lower class neighborhoods. Here again we also see how the largest amounts of ash and dust are placed where Grand Sachs' destruction is itself most dire, where even the mounds we see piled up along the Golden District streets are relatively small in comparison. For the question of what all this dust and ash is from, we're looking at it. Busted bricks and charred timbers. As we can see in what lower sections of the city remain, including our way to the Forbidden Lands, buildings outside the wealthy districts of Landell were mostly made out of wood, and all burnt to shit. In contrast, the richer, more sturdy stone and tile buildings of Central Island were both less flammable and more defended. As such, the copious ashes and dust produced from the destroyed homes of the peasantry were carried every way around by the wind to the rest of the surviving city, piling it up wherever it could and getting in our way. As can also be seen, there are barely any ashes along the upper walkways of Lane Dell, and no ashes whatsoever past the likes of America's Bedchamber or the Divine Bridge, these surfaces all having been merely too high up for the ashes, if not screams, of the rest of the cities to reach. As opposed to if these ashes had come from above the city, such as from the Ur Tree itself or something like that, there would be a lot more of them found around the Elden Throne and elsewhere than nothing, because it's certainly not like Morgoth's been doing any cleaning. But hold on, some others of you might say, about, like, the destruction around Landell. I heard, in this video specifically, by YouTuber The Tarnished Archaeologist, that the space above Landell's lake was actually Eternal City 1 in Deeproot, and that the outlines of the two places line up. Okay, so, I don't normally watch other people's Elden Ring videos, currently, because by god, this game takes enough of my goddamn time already. And I have other things I have to do too, anyway. But, by happen chance, this video was among the only Elden Ring videos that I have seen since I first began the making of this show. Solely because my friend decided to send it to me because they happened to like it. And, by this miracle, when some of the comments mentioned this topic in response to episode 3, I actually happen to know what they were talking about. Don't get used to this happening again. I'm so out of the loop at this point, basically you could call me weakly interacting massive particle. I have not seen any other of the Tarnished Archaeologist productions, nor most anyone else's, for like two years now, deliberately. Because while the cartoon character Snake Eyes Teiru G is a sniper, I am a hermit who lives in a furnace. But in any case, that video is inaccurate. Upon tracing the outlines of the buildings of Eternal City 1, with some portions lying outside the bounds of Landell entirely, we see that its buildings do not line up with the missing space between Landell's big doors and the gatehouse Grand Sachs is slumped over. Nor does it, 
to quote the video directly in regards to Landell, actually appear to complete the missing part of the remaining city. The video also calls this space a bizarre abyss and a chasm of nothingness for some reason. It's not nothingness though, it's water. It's a lake. And you can see that it's water on the map anyway, so why'd you call it that, detective? You could have just, like, looked at it when you were writing the script for that vid, couldn't you? So what is, what is this? Why'd you say they matched? Why'd you say that? Before I finally go, even though this isn't something I've looked into really enough to proclaim, as I usually do, among my friends and I, I have a hunch that in this setting, temperature and all that would scientifically entail is specially equivalent to death and life. Ghost flame by itself, obviously related to undeath, is literally cold fire. And intuitively, the idea of death equaling coldness corroborates with Elden Ring's own law of regression. That is to say, the scientific law invented by the scholars of the Golden Order to describe entropy, the dispersing of heat, where death itself in universe comes from. So, assuming we take all this and use it to say that cold magically equals death, then the opposite of death, life, should perhaps be magically equal to heat, right? Because there's evidence I can use to corroborate it. Fia, describing the absorbing of other people's life energy, very consistently refers to it as literal warmth. In her own terms, resurrecting someone through the deathbed ritual is literally the giving of heat to their lifeless corpse. And not just that, but both the Frenzy Flame Stone and its cousin, the Warming Stone, explicitly equate the restoring of your HP as also being from warmth. Two instances of the exact same turn of phrase in completely separate contexts. Does that not strike you as suspiciously particular? Especially for... here? And especially since this isn't even bringing up how weird with fire, in general, this story has already been. So far. And weird with electricity too, for that matter. Giving us cold electricity, g gravity electricity, and death electricity too. I guess I'd be remiss not to count that either. Just what is the devil supposed to be going on with all these different forms of like universal energies having so many magical variations? Well, you know how I said like in episode three, that while IRL, our minds are made out of electricity, but in Elden Ring, that minds are made out of, instead, magical energy. I'm wondering now if uh, that isn't actually supposed to just apply to everything. As in, if in the setting of Elden Ring, electricity itself is not just literally, fundamentally a magical thing. And that the same shouldn't be the case for fire, too. Hence, so many different kinds of fire and lightning existing, seemingly so arbitrarily, being because it is arbitrary. I mean, hey, magic damage and holy damage are already inherently magical, right? Why couldn't the other two types, fire damage and lightning damage, join in on that? The concept of magic in Elden Ring is already made to incorporate mundane things like thoughts and free will, where we've so far seen ordinary things like gravity being given unique consequences in the setting, like the ability to manipulate fate. Other mundane things in fantasy settings that we'd be well-born in taking for granted, like temperature and electricity, may very well be part of this course. Perhaps what I've been calling magical energy so far is actually meant to be, in Elden Ring's world, mere energy in general, leading me back to us cold equaling death, and heat equaling life. And since, as we observe by the Crystallians, that inorganic material is just as able to sustain legitimate actual life as organic material is, I wonder if, then, 
where the ground we stand on changes and churns under tectonic forces and reaches at the center of the earth, temps even hotter than the surface of the sun. Could the planet under our feet itself be alive? Where blood is indeed the unanimous medium by which magical energy interfaces between the material and ethereal worlds, what should that make magma? A material that, as it just so appears, already does contain magical energy inside it. Did it strike you, like me, just how similar in appearance the powers of the fell god, the god-devouring serpent, and the formless mother all are? What if it turned out, then, that they all shared an origin, too? What if what we yet know as the Blood Star was, in actuality, the very Earth itself? A star that is to say, a stellar object, also flowing with its own unique kind of life-carrying fluids. Do you think it should be, then, that the Earth does not bleed? That a planet's cuts don't also erupt, as our very own do? Or was it not by the geothermal vents of the ocean, powered by the planet's volcanic discharge, that life itself first sprang out of? Putting down the theatrics then, as I said, this isn't something that I actually, like, believe yet. Although I said it quite well, didn't I? That was all just presentation. And the idea itself is something I'm hesitant to actually claim. I can't think of anything in the story that conflicts with this theory, of course, but obviously that doesn't actually prove anything. There's nothing in this story to disprove a theory like Godric's allergic to peanuts, but that doesn't exactly prove that either. Nor is my own lack of imagination, in the first place, a particularly trustworthy source. Unlike for what I covered regarding the similar in scope structures of material and ethereal reality in ER with SCT-3, one of the regular canon-only installments of the show, this idea for life and heat and magic and energy, for me, lacks any of that kind of dramatic evidence I'd want to call a smoking gun. That is to say, not enough to gamble on. And personally, I'm not that interested in looking into this topic seriously, specifically until after the DLC comes out. According to recent interviews, there's not planned to be any further content for Elden Ring 2022 after Shadow of the Earth Tree's release, meaning effectively that this game's story will legitimately be complete. If there's to be any relevant information that will be revealed towards my Elden Ring temperature theory, then it'll certainly be in there, so I'd want to see that stuff first. In the meantime, perhaps, I have you convinced? Perhaps even I have myself convinced, and I'm just hiding it from you. Either or, for until season two of this show, I have bigger things to bet for. But just imagine if it was. If the Earth itself was alive, perhaps even if it possessed a will, wouldn't every other star too? How great would that be? By the way, Ronnie, if someone made, like, a clone of you, like, if someone made someone else and they were technically a clone of you because they were made through a duplication of the process by how you were made, so indirectly the that person that was made was, like, a clone of you, would you, like, know about it? Or would you, like, not know about it? Because, like, would it be a secret? Because if this clone or duplicate of you or whatever was made like sometime after the Night of Black Knives or something like that, then that'd be after you destroy the connection you had with your original biological body. So there wouldn't be any magical way for you to like make any indirect magical contact with the rest of your biological relatives because you wouldn't have that magic of grace from sharing America's blood that connected you guys anymore. So like if someone did end up making technically a duplicate version of you, then like you wouldn't have any way of knowing about it if that person who did that didn't tell you, right? So like, is Melanie your clone? Anyway, 
In this installment of our show, we've covered what amount to some of my theories regarding the story of this game. But in the following installment, we'll be doing something different. You may have heard, but a long undefined number of years ago, there was a murder of a man who is supposed to be invincible. The conspiracy was buried, however, attributed to a group that, in essence, belonged to nobody, working alone without a motive in sight. And it is just not true. That's right. As a Snake Eyes, I know by who, and I even have a few leads as to why. So, until then, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you just can't get enough of yours truly, you can directly support the continuing of this show by going to the TLGTW official fan club on coffee and buying a few gallons of gasoline to help keep the author's head on fire. Plus, after she's finally able to pay off her federal loan for the college she dropped out of, she'll probably have a lot more energy to actually make these things faster, too. And finally, for when the next installment to this one is eventually released, you'll be able to reach it by the link in this video's description. Or by likely clicking to it from somewhere around here. So Ronnie, would you also say you're more into girls?